Okay, so welcome to the Influence Through Storytelling session. I'm super excited to introduce Allison Bloomfield Meyer to you. Allison is a leadership communication consultant and executive coach. Uh, she's an assistant lecturer at Haas for leadership communication. And she also runs and manages her own executive coaching practice called Unconditional Leadership. And prior to her career in leadership development, she worked at Apple and iTunes for eight years, building their digital content business. So please well, uh, join me in giving Allison a warm welcome. Thank you, Michelle. All right, so we just heard an amazing panel of four different leaders and their stories. So I want to take a quick survey. Who among you uses stories now to influence? Show of hands. Who among you would like to use stories to influence? Who among you likes listening to stories? Yeah, yeah, so by the end of today, what we're gonna do is each one of you is going to have your own leadership story that you can use and apply to share an idea, to connect with people, and to demonstrate your leadership. So we're just gonna jump right into it. It's 1995, San Francisco. I'm on the stage of Presentation Theater with the San Francisco Shakespeare Festival. It's my first professional theatrical role as a chorus member in the musical The Boys from Syracuse. I'm wearing this ridiculous ancient Greek outfit, a pleated miniskirt, and this top with like silver lame Madonna things coming out. It's completely ridiculous and embarrassing, but I'm so excited. Because you see, my whole life, my dream had been to make my career as a singer. And this was my first real professional gig. Doing this show, I got eight weeks towards the 50-week program to join Actors' Equity Association, the union of professional theater artists and stage managers. Now, getting into equity is kind of like getting your MBA. It's a sign of credibility. It's a sign that you have the experience and the chops to do the job. It's also the key that gets you in a door for jobs that I had no other way to access. Well, so that's 1995. For the next several years, I'm working really hard doing theater. And to support myself, because, you know, this show was paying me $200 a week, I started a consulting practice doing accounting for small business. And so I did these two things for quite a while. Accounting by day, acting by night, and after a while I realized this was really untenable. I was putting all my heart and soul into performing. I was burning out. My bank balance was not impressive, and I never had times for, time for friends or relationship. So in 2005, I made a switch. I thought about it. I looked at my two different careers, and I threw all the pieces up in the air, and I said, OK, I'm going to find something new. Three days after making that pledge to myself, I got a call from JD, the boyfriend of a woman I'd done five shows with. And he said, you know, we need someone at Apple who knows music. Want to come in? So I did. I went to Apple, where I worked for the next eight years, starting my new career. It was hard to start all over again, but I've learned that we have the capacity to reinvent ourselves, and we have the capacity to write our own story. I could have said at that time, I gave up my dream, my lifelong dream of being an actress. I'm a failure. I blew it. But I decided that I could take that choice of stepping away from what I loved to create something new for myself. And now, 10 years after that, after doing the MBA program, I discovered I could teach communications. And all those skills that I studied for years as an actor, I put into play now, helping people with how they present themselves, 
their confidence. And like you heard in some of the last sec sessions, what do you need to believe to succeed? So today we're going to talk a little bit about the different stories that leaders tell. And before I get to that, I wanted to share this quote. Noel Tishy wrote a book called The Leadership Engine, and he said, leadership is autobiographical. If I don't know your story, I don't know who you are as a leader. So before we get into your stories, I wanted to check, just have you turn to the person next to you, and just for the next two minutes, share some experiences you just saw it, four leaders here sharing stories. Talk a little bit about why do leaders tell stories? Just for the next two minutes. Turn to the person next to you. <laughs> Introduce yourselves. So when I was at Apple, they always said that I was, you know, I had charting disease, that I, I loved to get up to the whiteboard. So just shout them out. What are some of the reasons that people tell stories? Motivation. To share their experience. To share their experience. Yeah. To inspire. What do you mean by to inspire? Have to have people believe in you. Right. How inspirational did you find these stories today? Yeah. And the reality is we all have these stories. We just have to take a little time to self-reflect and find them. What else? Inspirational to connect. I heard something over here. I'm sorry? The why. So you mean share what your why is? Yeah. Noel Tishy talks about leaders tell three kinds of stories. The who am I story. So I just shared with you a who am I story, where I come from. The who are we story. It's teams, the stories of teams. What, are we, what do we want to accomplish as a team, as a company? Or what do we want to accomplish here at Haas with our four defining principles? And then the third type of stories are vision stories. So Tanya talked about she had a vision of what kind of business owner she was going to be. And she kept on being limited, running into the obstacle of other people's vision for her. But she kept on believing in her own vision of herself, and she kept on telling it to people and selling it to people. Yeah. Why else do we tell stories? Yeah. Vulnerability. Vulnerability. Can you say more about that? Thank you. Yeah, so when we share some of our vulnerability, I like to say we open ourselves up so that we can connect with other people. And what did you say? Connective yes. tissue? Connective tissue can be laid down. Beautiful. Thank you. One more. Why do leaders tell stories? Credibility. Credibility. Can you say more about that? Fantastic, yeah, instead of saying, she said credibility so people can understand where you're coming from and that you have the ability to do something. If someone comes in, there's, there's a big difference between uh, someone coming in and saying, oh yeah, I understand what you do, but if they come in and they've actually done it. I, I work with a heavy equipment company and the CEO of the company 
family-owned company, he started out turning a wrench, fixing trucks. Now he's the CEO of the company, but he can do any job inside the company. That's credibility, and he shares those stories. All right, so we use stories to connect to, for credibility, for vulnerability, to inspire people, and that's what you're gonna be about today. Now, the process of using a story to connect and inspire, not every moment is a moment to use a story in. So when you're talking about convincing people, let's see. We have the analytical information and the emotional information. So what do you want them to know and what do you want them to feel? And any presentation, any argument you have, it's useful to use both of these buckets of information. Can I find a balance between the facts and the data and the charts, and then the stories and the images and using the imagination? So to share with us a little bit of how to use, how she's used stories, I want to now invite up Helen Min. Helen is a technical marketer and she's currently the lead of enterprise marketing at Dropbox. I don't think I have a Helen slide. <laughs> the three kinds of stories. And uh, in addition to having her MBA from Haas, she also has a bachelor's and a master's in communication from the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. And she'd like to share with us how she learned to use stories. So Helen. Hi, thanks. thanks for having me. Thanks for the nice introduction. Um, I'm so happy to be here today, and I was really lucky to be able to catch the last bit of, of some of the stories that were shared in this auditorium um, before panelists. And I think it's really important for us to know that storytelling is, is used by leaders uh, to, you know, like we shouted out here, connect with audiences, inspire people, lead organizations and markets into new directions, new strategies. But what I wanted to talk about was um, something maybe you can relate to right now a little bit more. And that's storytelling can be an equally powerful tool for those of us who are on our paths to becoming leaders. And I get asked all the time about technology marketing and being a technical marketer and what that means. And you know, I, I go through the motions, but every now and then I'm just sitting there like, how did I even get in this position? Because when people talk to me and they ask me questions, it's so inevitable, like, oh, of course. I mean, you look at her resume and she made this one step and it went to another step. And you know, obviously it led to this position to where she is today. So she's got this credibility like you talked about. And so I wanted to share just two very quick stories of how I discovered the power of storytelling. And both of the times they were through my process of being a candidate. And these are very uh, uh, genuine stories, not ones that I usually share. But uh, the first time I learned about the power of storytelling was really out of necessity. So in 2008, uh, how many of you are working in an industry that was affected by the economic recession? OK, great. <laughs> and so I was working in, in one such industry. And let's be totally honest, uh, and nothing leaves the room. Um, <laughs> like. I really needed to get out of the situation that I was in. And uh, similar to Allison, you know, it's a friend of a friend. You get an opportunity. And um, you guys might have heard of the company. It was called Facebook. And they asked me to come in and just talk to them a little bit about you know, my background and advertising. And to be totally honest with you, as proud as I am about being a graduate of the University of Illinois, I just didn't fit the profile of the people that worked at Facebook. I didn't graduate from Stanford. I wasn't you know, an Ivy League graduate. And I just felt very, very out of place. But I told you that I needed to really get out of the industry that I was working in. So it was this, this corner of, OK, this is my one shot. How am I going to convince them that I was made for this position, that I'm the best person, the most qualified candidate for, for, for this job? So out of necessity, I was able to connect you know, the, the, the firm that I was working um, at, the sort of characters that I had to work with, and draw parallels to what it would be like to work with a team of engineers. And, you know, long story short, I got the job. And that was, of course, the first pivot into working in the tech industry. And, you know, as a product marketer, um, I used storytelling to tell inspiring stories about how Facebook was developing something new that the product hadn't seen yet and 
you know, why, although it was unconventional and uh, it was of a you know, completely different format and measurement system, why you should take it seriously. So many applicable uh, stories being told through my job. But most recently, last summer, um, I, was, uh, I got a phone call from a, a friend of mine who I'd worked with at, at, at Facebook, and um, he said, we have this opening at the Dropbox, we're gonna start building an enterprise product, and um, you'd be perfect for the role. And I sort of laughed it off because I had never worked in an enterprise SaaS company. I spent my whole career with marketing to CMOs. I couldn't tell you anything about an IT person. And you want me to lead the team? So anyways, a good friend of mine, so I took him up on the coffee and I met with the hiring manager. Um, and the conversation was such a great one. And at this point, you know, I was intrigued. But I wasn't looking. And so in true fashion, when you're being you know, courted by a company, they say, oh, just come in and just meet a couple people. And so I came in, and it was a full-on 12-person interview loop, like 30 minutes, back to back, and then at the end, I had to give a presentation. And, and I'm, I'm sitting there thinking, like, okay, um, you know, a, a, a senior vice president of sales asked me, like, you know, so why are you interested in this job? And my, my, in my head, I'm thinking, well, I don't know. You guys called me. But at this point, I was so passionate about the opportunity and so intrigued by, by the the role and, and sort of the, the market challenge that they were facing because, you know, as you guys know, Dropbox, um, very traditionally consumer and small business focused product, they were trying to go into enterprise. So on the spot, I'm basically connecting the dots between being at Facebook for five and a half of its most pivotal years on the B2B side and how Dropbox will have a lot of similarities in building their B2B business and their future. Basically, so long story short, I mean, the rest is history. I've been with Dropbox for about eight months now, and it's been it's been fantastic. But the reason I shared with you these stories is that, you know, how many of you are in a career right now, or on a path, or in an industry, or, or you know, you're probably a lot of you are in school where you're thinking, I'm interested in something, I don't know what it is yet, or I do know what it is yet, and it's going to require somebody taking a chance on me. Anybody? So we talk about resumes and your LinkedIn profile being a story-telling vehicle a lot. And, and, I, and I truly believe that, right? Take time on those things. But the format is really limiting. There's bullets. You know, there's, it's a piece of paper. Yeah. So I think the thing that, you know, Allison mentioned about her friend's boyfriend giving her a call and the things that, you know, the two examples that I just had about somebody giving me an opportunity to tell my story. Find every opportunity to tell your story in person in person, and between now and that opportunity or those opportunities, rehearse, practice, make the person believe that it was inevitable for you to take this role and that every step that you've taken in your career has really led to this moment. Because those voices in your head of, I don't know why I got this phone call, or oh my gosh, this is so random, why well, I don't know, you called me, like those, those aren't the things that you present. And so when you, when you, uh, you know, I'm being very open and candid right now about the doubts that I had in my mind, but I think that both times that, that I was speaking to, you know, folks that I was interviewing with and convincing them that, that I was perfect for this role, I was connecting the dots. So the two things that um, I think our stories had in common about our career journeys is one, when you have an opportunity to tell your story, somebody is already interested in you. If you're being invited to share your story, there was something about you. There's a hunch, there's something maybe from your resume, but maybe it was a recommendation. Meet them halfway. Make it really easy for them to follow through on their hunch. And you can do that through your story. You can overcome, well, my resume says that I'm this type of person, but I'm not. I'm really completely suited for this role, and let me tell you why. So enjoy today. You're in the best hands possible, and thanks for letting me share my stories. <laughs> Stay up for a second, please. Yeah. So just uh, part of what I teach is all about feedback and acknowledgement. If we could just hear, what are one or two things you really appreciated from Helen coming in and telling her stories? Yes. The risks you were willing to take. The risks you were willing to take. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what, what's Very going different. on in your head versus what is happening in front of you. Yes.
Yeah, connecting the dots of where you are now to where you want to go. Okay, last one. And tell her, you said. That's great. Yes, use every face-to-face -face opportunity. Thank you so much, Thank Helen. You. Thank you. All right. Now it's your turn. Everybody up on your feet. Find a partner. Somebody you don't know, maybe. A chance to meet a new person. And you guys can spread out. There's a little more room up there. All right. Are you gonna... So what we're going to do Okay, so as advertised, this is a hands-on storytelling workshop. And the way we're going to make this work in the 50 or so minutes that we have is that we just have a lot of fun. <laughs> That's the first thing. The second thing is decide with your partner, one person will be A and one person it will be B. A will be the speaker, and B will be the coach. And then we're going to help A build their story. The coach is going to coach them. I'll give directions. And once we've gone through A's story, we'll switch and do B's story. So decide right now who's A, who's B. OK, so A's. A, think. And actually, this is for everyone. The story I'd like you to think about is, I'd like you to think about a story, a moment. It could be a moment of pride, a moment of triumph. Those of you who did leadership communications with Professor Rittenberg and me, you've already thought about this a bit. But something that made you who you are today. For me, it was that moment of deciding to take an entry-level job at iTunes, even though I'd had a successful career up to then. For Helen, it was the why the heck did they call me, but I'm going to take the meeting. What is something that you did that you're proud of that made you who you are today? And it could be a lesson you learned from your grandmother. It could be something a teacher said to you when you were a small child. It could be anything. So for the next three minutes, A, tell B your story. All right? All right, so you've just heard the story. Did, how many people were able to tell the whole story? So you, a lot of you. How many people need a little more time? Yeah, yeah. So part of what we're do, working on is the design of the story. How can you tell a concise story? So now you've got the story out. The juices are flowing. So the next round, what we're going to do is A is just going to tell the beginning of the story. So stories all have a structure a beginning, a middle, and an end. In the beginning of the story, that's how you set the stage, the status quo. I started with July 1995, stage of the presentation theater. I'm wearing this ridiculous costume. So now for this round, so we call this a vertical takeoff. A vertical takeoff is getting people right into the start of the story. So the opposite of a vertical takeoff is slowly, slowly going. A rocket goes up, an airplane slowly comes off the ground. So a, a, a bad start to a story would be something like, I'm going to tell you a story now. And it's this story about this time about 20 years ago. And I was working on this project. And it was a really cool project because I was in a play. You know, that kind of thing. Just like so. <laughs> A nice way to start it is with the date or your age and where you are. So now, A, 25 seconds, just think about starting the story, where you're going to start. You guys ready? And Bs, your job is to be the coach. What do coaches do? They pay attention. They encourage. So feel free to nod. 
and make those listening noises. Uh-huh. Yeah, all right, so 25 seconds. All right. Did, who finished in 25 seconds? So did, did you have too much time? So maybe if you had a little more, t if you had too much time and you already started moving into the middle of the story, coaches, help them embellish. What detail did you want to no, maybe they were at their graduation. What were they wearing? Or what did the air feel like? Um, if they went over the 25 seconds and didn't finish, how can coaches, how can you help the storyteller tighten down the story? What was the detail you didn't need to help move the story along? So one minute for feedback. <laughs> Round three. Now, does anyone remember, is anyone old enough to remember the days of radio? <laughs> yes. So what did the family do sitting around the radio, listening to the radio? So now we have this very powerful tool of communication, which is our voice. We can talk louder and softer. We can talk very, 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 very fast. We can talk very, very softly. We can talk very slowly. We can emphasize important words. It's the vocal variety. So now what I want you to do is, let's see, A is the storyteller. So B, stand in front of A. Will you come here and, and help me demonstrate this for a moment? OK, so Alicia is the storyteller. And I am the coach. And she's going to stand behind me and just with the power of her voice, she's going to tell the whole story using vocal variety. All right, so coaches, and coaches, your job, coaches, 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 your job is to listen for two or three moments where you really love the vocal variety, maybe a phrase they said or how they slowed down or whatever, OK? You guys ready? So the whole story. <laughs> so now, coaches, give them a little feedback. What were one or two parts of that vocal variety that you really loved in the story, that really strengthened the story? <laughs> so we just have, we have two more rounds. We're almost there. So I talked about the vertical takeoff bring us into the story, set the status quo. The middle of the story is where there's a challenge, there's an obstacle, something changes. And then the end of the story is the resolution. And when we want to influence someone to bring a message, we may need to underline it at the end and say, so what I learned is. So as you're crafting your story, when you get to the end of it, See if you can name that call to action, that, that resolution, that thing you learned from your grandmother or this situation or your teacher. So now for this round, um, no voice, just body. So watch me for a second. The, the, now I know this sounds a little crazy, but think about it for a minute. About 65% of communication is nonverbal. And most of us are very smart and talk just with our heads. But we have this whole, this is our machine of expression. This is our tool. And we have gestures, we have body language, and we can communicate using eye contact and gestures. And so what I want you guys to do on this round is A, when you tell your story, no words, just body language. It might look something, I'm gonna exaggerate a little, but I, that's what I want you to do, to find something new outside of your normal comfort zone, your status quo of how you express yourself. So if I were starting my story, it might look something like this. <laughs> So, you know, that's what I'm talking about. So let your <laughs> 
don't take yourself so seriously. <laughs> Experiment and let, let some of that stuff come out. I mean, if you have kids and they're telling stories, they do not go, well. I, I mean, they're alive, so let yourself come alive. So try it out. Tell the story one more time. No words, no words, just, just body, silent. Great, yeah. And coaches, coaches, give them some feedback. What gesture really added to the story? What do you want them to keep? Maybe it's not as big as running in place. Maybe it's just a little bit of motion. Give them a couple ideas. Feedback. And now, your chance to put the whole thing together. Vertical takeoff, landing the ending, body language, vocal variety, and your intention. What did I learn? What is the message I want to share with you? More than anything else, by telling you this story, I want you to understand how important this is to me. So what is that key message? So A's, the whole story with all the different rounds, you've been putting it all together, and now just have fun and tell your story. So 90 seconds. How, how were the stories? How are the stories? Good stories? What? Yeah, the stories improve over time. This, this having a little focus on the design, having a coach to help you understand Oh, this element was really interesting to me. I wanted more of that. Or, you know, this detail didn't really add a lot to the story, but I was curious about that. You know, we know our own stories in a very internal way, and when we start putting them out, and it, it's helpful often to have that feedback so we understand what resonates for other people and what connects for other people. And now, it's B's turn. <laughs> so B, tell your whole story, and then we'll go through the same process for you. Three minutes. It was a dark night. It was a dream where my husband and I were climbing across this mountain, and it was shale, and it was rocks, and we were falling down in the rest as we were climbing across, and it was sharp, and a great story. Now B, let's go back to that vertical takeoff. Really 
25 seconds to help us understand, set the scene for us, get the juicy details. Where were you? When was it? What was going on? How did you feel? So take 25 seconds, and coaches, be ready to listen and see how it impacts you and see how it draws you into the story. You guys ready? 25 seconds. OK, coaches, A's, help them understand what really worked in that vertical takeoff. Was it too long? Was it too short? Help them decide what details to add or to toss out to really bring us into the moment of that story. Just take a minute for feedback. <laughs> and just, I love the energy in this room. It is so amazing. So just a note, I've been coming by to some of you in the front. I invite you, when you're receiving feedback, to let it in. It's, no one's got a spear. No one's going to prod your soft internal organs. The enemy is not in this room. So open up your bodies to let. It's hard. This is what we, we don't like confrontation and just getting a little bit of feedback. So let yourselves be open. So now, radio play. So storyteller behind, coach in front, and the vocal variety. Start getting the story down closer to 90 seconds. The whole story with the feedback you just got on the vertical takeoff. So coaches, coaches on the vocal variety, Give them one or two things, one or two moments that really worked for you, that really strengthened the impact of the story. Just give them some quick feedback. And now it's time to make sure to add in that body language. So run, jump. Oh, I'm already seeing it up there. Yeah. So one more time. This time, no words. No voice, in silence. Try the body language out, yeah. I want to see big gestures. Use this whole beautiful expressive instrument you have. And see how hard it is to not talk? It's almost impossible to not talk. All right, so coaches, coaches help. Help your storyteller find one or two gestures that you really felt strengthened the story. You know, when we come up to present, we can get really stiff because we feel on display. But if you watch yourself in the cafe with friends or in the bar or in class, suddenly we, we use our hands, we use our faces. So give them feedback. What really worked? What would you like them to add into the story? Keep for telling. All right, so now put it all together. 90 seconds, vertical takeoff, clear beginning, middle, and end, the intention of the story, why they're telling the story, what's important. So bees, really share your complete story now with your partner. And then after this, we'll get, we have a few minutes to hear a few of these stories. Finish up your story and then thank your partner. And then come on down. Thank your partner and then come sit down. Do you need to tell your story? So now, now, storytelling. The human story is never boring. We each have a story to tell. And in this room, there are, each of you has dozens of leadership stories. You've just worked on shaping a single story. And now what, to fin close off our session, 
I'd like to invite whoever who'd like to, to come up and share their story. And I've asked Lori to, I've volunteered Lori <laughs> because she shared her story with me and it was just beautiful and inspiring. So give her a hand. You probably do. I think there's one right here. Let's see. I know. Let's see. Let's see if we can. How about that? It's a very live mic, so you should be fine, I think. Okay, good. I don't have to get super close to it. I don't think so. Okay. I may look calm, but believe me, I am shaking in my boots. Okay. There you go. I want to share a night where I had a dream, and it was a couple years ago. I don't really remember the date because at this time in my life, it felt like everything was just dark and black, and it was all crunched together. It was a night, the dream was I was climbing across a hill with my husband, and it was this wall of like shale, you know, the kind where the gravel breaks down and it's gritty and you're like climbing and it's sand and it keeps moving underneath your feet and the dust is coming up and I'm tasting dirt and it's dark and I, I feel this incredible sense of despair. And he's out in front of me and in between us are my two kids and I'm behind. And as we're climbing across, not sure if we're gonna make it, he grabs a big boulder and he pulls it down and it takes the kids out and they die in my dream. So I, tr I turn into this like massive creature with these claws and I rip him in half and I kill him in my dream. And I woke up and I was crying and I felt like I was gonna have a nervous breakdown because this was a time in my life when my husband was an alcoholic and he was drinking. And at that, that night, I realized it's time for me to do something about this. And I woke up and I realized I had to set the boundaries and tell him to go get help because I knew I couldn't help him. And so he left. I took care of the kids. And I knew at that point the marriage was over because there was just too much pain. But I wanted him to heal. I wanted the kids to have a dad. And so when I think back on that, what I realized is it took so much courage for me to go through that. It took so much courage for me to hold the space for him to heal that I held the container for the entire family. It wasn't just me. I didn't just say, I'm out of here. I held that, and that took such courage for me. And it took, the other piece of it was that I realized I was able to see the light at the end of the tunnel, that I had the ability to create a possibility for myself that was beyond that dark time. And so now what I do, I am an empowerment coach because I learned that even through what psychologists will call a post-traumatic stress scenario, there's post-traumatic growth. And that the power that comes out of that is what is the value, is what I teach. I made it through and I can help others do the same. Thank you. <laughs> so, two, two appreciations for Lori and her story. What touched you? What moved you? Yes. Being open, vulnerable, and transparent. Yeah. One more. Yes. Yeah, 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 and we all have those stories. The inspiration was a story about courage, and then you talked about courage. Yes, yeah. thank you so much. Thank you, thank you guys. Another story. Who else? More stories. Who found a story today they didn't know they had? It happens all the time.
Yeah. So be easy on me. Um, when I was 17 and a half, I went to the mail and I found all these letters of acceptances from college and I was super duper excited. My parents were refugees from Laos, they were illiterate, and no one else in my family had gone to college. And I would be one of three students out of 450 in high school to go to Berkeley. And so I'm excited to be here. Um, so I go to class and I remember distinctly, anybody know what Stockton is? first city to file for bankruptcy, um, and also very hot. It was 110 degrees, I was in class, and my honors economics teachers asked me, so Samorin, where are you gonna go to college? I said, you know, I'm really excited. I got accepted to Berkeley, and I'm gonna stay close to home. And she looks at me, and she says, good luck not flunking out. And my heart dropped. Um, and you know what? I was scared. I was afraid that she was right, and I was unsure about whether I was making the right decision because nobody left the community. And some people who had left failed, and they did come back after their first year, and I was really worried about it. So when I found myself at college, I knew that everybody else was ahead of me. They were taking all these honors preps classes. I could barely write an essay. But what I am proud to say is that I worked and I busted my ass. And not only did I graduate from college with high honors, I also continued to go to a top 10 law school, also again here at Berkeley. Go Bears. <laughs> And I went on to be you know, an attorney at a large law firm. And there again, I found that you know, my passion wasn't really to make corporations richer, although I support you and so glad that you support us. Um, <laughs> but I was able to turn that around and say my first passion was really about educating and empowering people. Because I remember that moment being so disempowering. And so now I'm a career counselor uh, at UC Hastings. I was a career counselor at Berkeley Law for the past three years. And I also have my private coaching practice. And what I fundamentally believe believe is the story that we tell today, which is that you have to have that kernel of belief. And when you have that kernel of belief, then you need to take action. And it may be a small step of just saying, F you economics teacher, I'm going to college. <laughs> Thank you. Couple appreciations of that story. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, taking ownership, yeah. Taking ownership of your accomplishments. I mean, it goes back to what Kelly said when the, the idea of the Olympian is someone who has to believe that they're going to succeed. I mean, uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said, I'm paraphrasing because I don't remember the exact quote, but she basically said no one can make you feel bad without your permission. I mean, honestly, in the work I've been doing, I find it's not the outside world that's judging us so harshly, it's we ourselves that are judging us so harshly. And celebrating our successes and acknowledging them is a great, it's important. One other thing you appreciated about her story, yes. Yeah. I do a lot of shielding in my language. Ah. Yes. So, so this woman here said she doesn't generally like strong language, but that that was an appropriate use of it. <laughs> they, those words actually have more impact when you use them very specifically. Okay, more stories. Who else has a story? I invite you to, yeah. I'm gonna hold the mic, because I'm not that tall. Own um, it. I'm gonna share this story uh, as a mom and as a woman and in a safe place. So I was one of those moms who was fortunate enough to be blessed with a very easy labor with my second son. It was one of those situations where I was watching Grey's Anatomy in the labor room one minute, three pushes later, he was out and I had my baby. 
Um, so I thought it was perfect. Um, and I'm, I'm definitely a type A person by nature and in control of a lot of things. And um, ironically enough, three days after his birth there, I was watching Grey's Anatomy again. And I started to see um, some strangeness in my vision. Suddenly, Meredith Grey was just a little green and hazy in my right eye. So I called the doctor and I asked to see if that's at all related to my labor. Um, is it a complication? Is that common? She asked for me to go to the ER. So quickly, I was at the ER with my three-day-old baby having scans and tests on my eye. So what the scans revealed was that um, there was actually a mass between my optic nerve and my brain. And in that moment, all I heard was brain tumor. <laughs> and so um, all of what I know about control and perfection and owning and being prepared was out the window. And all I had in that moment was my faith. Um, so I, my eyesight quickly deteriorated over 24 hours. Um, my right eye had gone completely dark. The doctors had advised for me to see neurologists um, at Stanford as specialists to see about procedures. And um, thankfully, they were able to quickly identify a procedure that can quickly and remove the mass in its entirety but they weren't uh, sure that I was able to have or restore vision in my right eye. So as they're taking me um, to the hospital, I say to my mom, although my body may be weak, my faith is strong. <clears throat> and so I carried this pivotal moment in my day-to-day -day and in my life challenges in knowing that um, I'm able to overcome situations in which I might feel out of control. And um, while you're not always prepared for the circumstances that you have, um, sometimes it's just a little bit of faith, um, belief with the absence of doubt. Um, and thankfully today, I stand before you with 2020 vision by the grace of God. Thank you so much. Yeah, overcoming adversity. Two appreciations for that story. Yes. Yeah, really taking your time with the story and bringing us moment to moment. A great way to tell a story is when you tell it in the present like that. You really let yourself be in it and you bring us along and bring us into that present. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the surrender. There's a lot of power in saying yes to what is, even if you hate it. All right, we have time for one more story. Do we have one more story someone would like to share? Yes, come on down. I have a feeling I'm going to need to raise this a little bit. We'll do it this way. So believe it or not, I was a pretty awkward kid. Nine years old, not really making friends. I think my mom worried about me an awful lot. So she got me involved in this great program called 4-H, which if you're from this side of the bay, you may know a little bit more about than if you're from the other one, but it's about uh, animal husbandry and uh, community service. A lot of those um, you know, it's a really strong extra extracurricular, sort of like Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts, but with an animal husbandry focus. So, I'm starting to make friends, I'm meeting people that are a little older than me, and I maybe have more uh, in common with, and 
I don't remember who mentioned it. It might have been my mom. Um, you know what you should do? You should raise sheep. You know, this big, kind of woolly, you make sweaters from them. Mary had a little one. <clears throat> so all of a sudden, I am in high school, and I have a flock of sheep. <laughs> I have so many sheep, I don't know how many there are at one point. But owning that and living as a farm kid. I lived in the suburbs. I got in my truck every morning, I drove to the barn, I fed, I showed up at school covered in mud one day. That was awkward. Um, but I had to miss class because I had a sheep giving birth and my mom had to work, so there it was. And what I did with that is what I'm most proud of is I took that experience and I wrote every scholarship application you could find about my experience there and, and some community service and some here and there. I had a full ride to college because of little woolly sheep. Aww. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate the story. Fantastic, yes. Yeah, the face. We have so much we can convey just with our face. I don't even know how many expressions are possible, but all the emotions have a different expression on the face. Yeah, we have so many muscles that move in so many ways. Another appreciation for that story. Yeah. Well, I would like to hear all of your stories. I'm sorry we don't have time for that today, but now that you've got your story, find someone in the next week or two. I challenge you to find someone, maybe it's at work, maybe it's in your family, and use this story to share your ideas with them, maybe influence them. So before we end, I wanted to share one more story. Maybe two stories. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I like to say that Le you, you, you have all heard some magnificent stories and ideas today, some very powerful concepts about leadership and personal mastery. And when I work with my clients, I'm always asking them to just pick one thing and work on it. And um, my view of leadership is, have you ever, so I'm kind of a recovering grumpy person. <laughs> I used to walk down the street kind of, you know, and have you ever had this experience, someone walks the other way and they smile at you? What happens? You smile back. And I think leadership is as simple as that. It's when you see a grumpy person, or even before you see them and you know there's one coming, you're ready to smile. It's that, it's that foresight to take the first step. And then the, the other story I want to share is, I just want to share my personal experience with this, being hard on yourself, the, the rating yourself. So every week, I go to the Native Sons building in San Francisco, tromp up the stairs to the fourth floor, to a funky little room with badly upholstered furniture, kind of smells musty, and I go to acting class. Now, I haven't acted for years, but I'm addicted to this class because I get the opportunity to practice in a safe environment uh, building skills and behaviors that I'm not so good at. So my teacher, about five months ago, he said, Allie, you don't like losing. And I'm like, who likes losing? <laughs> Nobody likes losing. 
And so ever since November, every week, I go into this class and he sets up an improvised scene where my job is to lose whatever the scenario is, but to keep my self-respect, to stay whole and centered, and I am a wonderful person. And I just invite you to consider the possibility that when you fail, that when you lose, it is not a measure of who you are as a person. You just lost. Thank you so much.